morning. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's a blessing to have you here. We hope you've had a good weekend. We believe uh, we've uh, been blessed, certainly, to be here to worship God and study His Word and uh, be with the congregation of the Lord's Church at this location this morning. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we thank you so much for being with us. You could be a lot of places this morning, and you chose to be here. And so we're so thankful and blessed to have you with us here this morning. And we hope that you are uh, blessed yourself by your time here in the fellowship, the study, and the worship uh, to God. This morning we're looking at uh, a parable, another parable, and this one is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And so if you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, we'll study this parable. Parable, and it'll actually start in verse number 31, Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse number 31. And we want to look at some questions this morning. We want to study the questions. These are in your bulletin as well. Who were the sheep? Who were the goats? Who are the least? And what made the difference? between the sheep and the goats? And why were the sheep saved? See, we're going to learn some things from this parable that will help us uh, know something about our own salvation. Now, it's interesting that Matthew is the only one, the only gospel writer that records uh, this parable. And in fact, many do not even consider this a parable. They say it's kind of like a parable. It's a parabolic saying. Uh, It's not really a full-blown parable. There's some parable type of elements in it. And that's not really important. Some people might think that's interesting as they study the body of the parables. Some say that it is a full-blown parable, but as I said, it's not uh, necessarily an important thing. But uh, there's not, there, there, this is a little bit different in the passage that we're going to look at than some of the more traditional, you might say, parables. So let me read this. Y'all don't mind reading the Bible, do you? Let me read this, and uh, that way we've all heard it, and then we can walk through it together. Look at Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse number 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? Verse 39, and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, so let's walk through this. Look at verse number 31, first of all, and notice that Jesus starts off this parable, if you will, starts off saying, calling himself what? Son of man, okay? Now, 
Son of man was used in the Old Testament, but it was uh, one way it was used was to identify Jesus as uh, the, the humanness of him. In other words, he had been born uh, in an earthly family, and he was certainly 100% deity, God, but he was 100% human. And so this identifies him with, with the human side, if you will, the Son of Man. He says the Son of Man will, uh, will come when he comes. And so clearly he's referring to himself. Now look in verse number 32, and he's clear about what scene he's talking about, about what situation he's talking about. He says before him, meaning Jesus the Son of Man, will be gathered all the nations. Because he says, I'm going to be coming in all of my glory with my angels. And before him, Jesus, the Son of Man, will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another. So we're seeing a glimpse of the final judgment. And it's going to be all people there. Everybody. And, and Jews, non-Jews, Christians, non-Christians, everybody is going to be there for this final judgment, this coming of the age. Now, if you look at the other parables, uh, like the parables of the wheat and the tares and parables of the net and others, Jesus has been talking about this day coming. The parable of the ten virgins, uh, the, 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 the workers, the servants, the good and, and uh, bad servants. He's been talking about this separation of good and bad for quite a while in Matthew, in this discourse leading up to the point he's at now in chapter 25. And he's been saying, the day of judgment is coming. I'm coming back. The day is coming. And he's been saying things like, get ready, be faithful, be alert, because this day is coming. Some of those parables were said to his disciples in private, and some were said to uh, a public audience. And just like in the other parables, Jesus uses some earthly elements. And so this is the parable-like uh, elements that we see in this passage of the sheep and the goats. He uses here, he chooses to use sheep and goats. Now for them, they would identify with that. That would be a great visual, uh, mental illustration to use, sheep and goats. He might use cars and trucks for us today or something like that but he used sheep and goats for them uh, so that they could visualize these two groups and so obviously at this time he's describing this judgment day when he comes and there's going to be a separation and he's been talking about this for a while now we don't uh, uh we often think that the goats were were inherently bad when they heard that they weren't thinking the goats were bad because the goats were an important part of their, their, their culture, their economy, uh, uh, money, all their, everything. So it wasn't a good or bad. The sheep and goats weren't for them inherently good or bad. That what, he's using that as the visual to get them to connect with what he's trying to tell them. Okay? So not all sources agree, but, but many sources even say that it was difficult to distinguish the sheep from the goats. In other words, they looked so much alike, especially from a distance out in the pasture, that you couldn't even tell the difference. Now, that would be similar to some of the other parables uh, that Jesus told. But the, the shepherd would know the difference, or you would have to get close to them to tell the difference. And, and uh, sources say that the, she the shepherds would even let them pasture together. And so it wasn't a good or bad value on the animal's themselves but what he does is after verse uh, 33 he doesn't talk about the sheep and the goats anymore because he's already got your got given you that mental picture you're already following him and he says what he did with the sheep and the goats and so with uh, with the it, it was good or ba or bad b based on what side he put them on because right in their culture was considered uh, positive and left was considered negative okay and so that's the distinction that he's making he just uses sheep on the right and goats on the left now we know he uses sheep and other ways in the bible as uh, uh his flock and the good shepherd and all of that so it makes sense but let's look at this uh the next our first question who are the sheep 
Now look at verses 34 through 36. In verse 34, now notice the first thing we see before we talk about the sheep, we see that Jesus has changed what he's referred him, how he refers to himself. He started off referring to himself how? As the son of man. Now he refers to himself how? As king. He says, then the king will say. You see, he's fully claiming that he's the king. There's no if, ifs, ands, or buts about it. He's not beating around the bush. He's boldly, clearly saying, I'm the king. He's already said that when the son of man comes. So we know he's talking about himself. And he's talking about uh, himself now being the king when the king is here. Because this is the end. This is the last, the end of that discourse. And some other things are about to happen. And he's already uh, launched his kingdom. It started off slow. If you remember other parables and people wanted a big, powerful king to, to come on and be large and in charge. And he said, that's not the way it works. But now he's saying, I'm the king. And when the king uh, is here, he will say. And so the king is going to be the one that makes the distinction and the separation. Now let's take a closer look at the sheep in verses 34. The sheep are those who are what? Blessed by my Father. The sheep are blessed by my Father. Now why were the sheep blessed by his Father, who, who we know is God? Now he tells us, look at verse number 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then, as we see, he turns uh, to... Uh, and, and when he says that, the people turn and they say, they're surprised. They don't know what, what he's talking about. When did we do this? We never saw you. We never did that. And we know he says, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So they were surprised when they did that. Now, the, the same thing was true for the goats. So who were the goats? The goats were those on the left. Now, they were just as surprised as the sheep on the right when he said, For I was, and you did not. And they said, Wait a second. We never saw you, Jesus, and needing help. When did we miss an opportunity to help you? As if they would have had they known, had they seen Jesus. And then he says, As you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me there in verse number 45. Now let's get to who are the least. Who are the least? And let's go to verse number 40 and look at the least. Now Jesus uses the word the least, that phrase, in verse 40 and in verse 45. But verse number 40 is a little different than verse number 45. Because in verse 40, he calls the least of these, what? My brothers. He calls them my brothers. And so it makes us wonder, why would he call the least of these my brothers? What did he mean by that? And there's some different interpretations of that. But let's first look and see who's he talking to. Who is Jesus talking to right now? Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 3. Matthew tells us, as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? So Jesus is talking privately to his disciples. See, he's just been telling them all of this, and they've been hearing all of this about the coming of the end of the age, how to live, be alert, be faithful, all of this, and now they come to him and they say, Jesus, explain this to us. How are we going to know when this day is coming? So he continues to talk to them. He goes on to tell them about the close of the age, about the day of judgment, about no one knows the day or hour. He gets into the parable of the talents, and he says, I've entrusted you with the kingdom. What are you going to do with it? And now he gets to this one of the, the last times that Matthew records that he's with his disciples, talking with his disciples before he's crucified. Because in Matthew chapter 26, what's about to happen? There's that plot to kill Jesus, and Judas agrees to betray Jesus, and Jesus knows this. So in Matthew 25, it's the end of this final discourse with his disciples. He's been teaching them, and he's preparing them because he knows what's about to happen. 
Now, the word brothers used there in verse 40 can mean some different things. It can mean relatives, neighbors, mankind, ethnicity, such as if he were talking to, about fellow Jews because he was a Jew. It can mean spiritual family as well. Now, some interpret this to mean that Jesus used the word brothers because he meant Christians only. Now, if that was the case, he would be saying in the parable of the sheep and the goats that the sheep are sheep because of how they treated the least being Christians. And so how they treated Christians is what made them uh, become sheep. In other words, how anybody treated Christians, that is what makes them sheep. Does that make sense? So that's one interpretation of it. But there's some, there's some problems that we have with that interpretation because is that saying that anybody can be a sheep and go to heaven as long as they treat Christians nicely? As long as they treat a Christian kindly, they can be a sheep and go to heaven? And so I can live however I want to live as long as I'm nice to Christians. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? That'd be nice. Now, they use Matthew 10, 40 through 42. If you're interested in looking at that further, they go there and they say, this is why he's extending that conversation, that, that, that what he's saying there, he's extending that here. And so who are the sheep? Are they, do they even have to be baptized? Can they be anybody, live any way, as long as they treat Christians or missionaries well? So those views, that view obviously has some challenges with it. Jesus, uh, but Jesus here, now it, the only time, every time he uses the phrase brothers, uh, everywhere else in the New Testament, he is talking about his disciples, baptized believers. And so that is one reason it gives people trouble. It can give us trouble when we say he uses the word brothers here. Wouldn't he obviously be talking about other Christians? But it just doesn't seem to make sense as we look at that. So, and knowing that the word brother can mean other things, he uses, I believe most accurately, the interpretation is he uses the word brother here because he's talking about all mankind. See, Jesus had always identified with the needy, hadn't he? He had always identified with the least. And he had, he, in fact, he was considered the least, wasn't he? Isaiah uh, chapter 53 and, and other places talked about Jesus, despised and rejected. He was the least. He was rejected in his hometown, rejected among his own people. He himself, as the king, remember, he said he was the king. So the king himself was the least and identified with the least, uh, his brothers. And he's saying, look, I identify with these people. He's talking to his disciples, and he's saying, look, your king here identifies with the least in this world. And I want you to pay attention to them, because how you take care of them, how you treat them makes a difference in, your in, in the way you're judged. He himself was an outcast. Now, so let's go a little further. What made the difference between the sheep and the goats? Now look at verse 40 and 45. They tell us, as you did it to one of the least, or as you did not do it to one of the least. So Jesus is clearly talking about a faith that takes action, isn't he? He's clearly not saying that it's just believing right. He's saying there's some action involved. Now, it can give us some trouble if we try to say, see, all we have to do is good works. As long as we do social justice, as long as we do good works, then we're in good shape. Well, that would be irresponsible because no parable says everything about everything the subject is talking about. And so you can't say that the parable is talking about everything or attempts to answer every question we might have. Jesus in parables is trying to say one thing. Maybe two things. And so everything in the parable can't mean something. We've got to figure out what is he trying to say and what did the hearers hear and understand. So he wasn't trying to say it's about salvation by works. He wasn't trying to say you don't have to believe right. He was trying to say this is the end. I, I don't have much, left, much time left with you. I want you to pay attention to the least because when judgment day comes, I want to know how did, you, how did you treat 
the least. Now look, the Bible teaches that works don't earn us salvation. Ephesians 2.10. Uh, uh, well, let, go back to that. Let's, let's look at that. Consider those questions. Um, yeah, go back to that. Look at this. Because Is it because you are saved you did these works? Or because you did these works you are saved? See, doing good works alone doesn't save you. But it's because you're saved, you can't help but do these works. Now go to the next one. Look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works. Okay? Look at Titus 2.14. Zealous for good works. He wants his people zealous for good works. Galatians 2.10. Do good works. Now there, Galatians 6.10 helps us understand the sheep and the goats and even Jesus calling the least my brothers. Because in Galatians 6.10, he says... As you have opportunity, do good to all people, especially those of the household of faith, okay? So he's saying, look, I'm not excluding Christians, but it's not just about how you've treated Christians, but it wouldn't exclude Christians, all right? And then James 1.27, uh, James is talking about pure religion that is uh, undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You see the, the, the practical life application to that, okay? So our final question, why were the sheep saved? Why were the sheep saved? Now, Jesus has been pounding uh, them about how to live their lives. He's been hitting the, the disciples hard with living right, be ready. He's been, he's been pounding this message to the public, and he, we know he was hard on the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders and the Jews, he was hard on them for this. But think about the parable of the talents, which he just told in the same setting. He just finished saying this. And in the parable of the talents, he's saying, I'll be back. He's telling them, I'm leaving you with the message of my kingdom, or the element in the parable is the talents. I'm leaving it with you. I'll be back. And I want to know when I come back, what would you do with my kingdom? Did you bring an increase? Okay, and so now he just came off of that parable and he comes into the parable of the sheep and the goats and he says, I'm back. How did you live your faith? I want to see what you do with your king, the kingdom. What you do with the message of the kingdom. How did you treat the least in this world? Now, the sheep were saved because they lived out their faith. They didn't overlook the least like the Pharisees did. Jesus was always criticizing the Pharisees. They were supposed to be the ones living it out, and they weren't. He said it's about living out your faith. Look at Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 through 28. He says this to the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful. You got it all. You got the look down. You got the act down. But within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus wanted his disciples to have a life that was evidenced that, that, that proved, that evidenced their faith. This is about a faith that is evidenced in life. And it was so important to Jesus. You, you know that one time he said, in uh, I think it was Luke chapter 6, he said, he that is faithful and that which is least, that's the same word. Now that was a different context he was talking about, but there's a principle there. When you're faithful with the least, the little, are you faithful with the, the least in the world? the least among you? Are you faithful to them? Are you living out your faith towards them? Now, the sheep were saved because they did the will of the Father. Now, read all of James chapter 2 because he's got a lot more to say about that. But let's zero in on uh, verses 8 through 9. If you really follow, uh, fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, see, the way you treat the least, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
if you shall love, uh, you sh- if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Consider the least. Now, the message of the parable of the sheep and the goats is how we fulfill that royal law. That's what it's about. Are you living out your faith? Do you love other people? Are you loving the least? And not just people that look like you, or not just people that you're comfortable with, or not just people that would be great to be here. We, we love to have them over here. Not just those people. Are you, are you considering and loving everyone? Now, Jesus already said this in Matthew 22. Look at verse number 37 through 39. And he said to him, you shall love, and there's a bigger context there, so read that. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. Just what James said. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So look at verse number 40. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I used to think that verse kind of was just didn't really mean anything. I just You just kind of... Stop at 39 and don't look at 40. No, 40 sums it up. 40 is saying, look, here's everything you need to know. Here's the essence of your faith. Loving God first more than anything else with all of your being and loving your neighbor as yourself. He says, that is me. That's how you live out your faith. Now, we know we can go to the Bible and talk about baptism. We can talk about, uh, uh, you know, right belief and doc- we can go through all the- but right now jesus is trying to tell his disciples look you can have all that down and how you treat the least will give you trouble on the day of judgment how are you treating the are you li- because that's proof of living out your faith that's what he's saying so how are you living out your faith is it real is it deep is it genuine and to the point of the, the least matter to you, the least among us and the least among our society. He said, what you do matters. How you live matters. Your life matters. It's not just about your belief. But if you can't say you love me and you don't love the least. Let's be a, let's be a church full of real kind of faith that loves the least. And, and that, that, that may mess us up. That, that, may, that may shake us up. We may need to ask ourselves some hard questions. Are we doing that as a church? Are we doing that as maybe a smaller ministry within the church? Are we doing that in our own life? See, we can't just say, well, the elders this and the deacons that and the preacher that. The first person we need to be talking to is the one we see in the mirror. Am I doing it? And then we need to be a congregation. If we're going to be the Lord's people, if we're going to let the church be the church, we need to be the church we read about in the Bible. To have a heart for the least because Jesus did. Because guess what? You're the least. We, we can't sit here and think we're not the least. It's some other people. that We didn't deserve anything God gave us. We don't deserve an ounce of his love. We don't deserve his grace. We don't deserve his mercy. But he already gave you your breath this morning. He woke you up this morning. He's already blessed you second by second. He's blessed you far more than you deserve. We're the least. Who are we to think there's some other least besides us? We got to love the least, even though we don't deserve it. And constantly be thankful for the grace and mercy of God. If, if there's anything uh, we can do for you this morning, you know, loving God starts with obeying the gospel. Loving God starts with dedicating your life to him. It starts with turning your life over to him. It starts with being immersed and united with Christ in baptism. That's where it starts, and then you walk that life of faith and love towards him. That's where it starts. So if there's any way we can serve you this morning, if you need the prayers of the church, if you want to study the Bible, uh, we're here to serve you this morning. You can come now as we together stand and sing.